My name is Sarah Henderson, and it is my pleasure today to introduce Angela Yao. Uh, Angela Yao is currently a PhD student at the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia, and she also works part-time with us at the BC Centre for Disease Control. Angela did her master's thesis on the public health utility of the blue sky forest fire smoke forecasting system, and she's been working in the field of forest fire smoke forecasting and surveillance and health effects ever since. So she's an excellent person to be talking on this subject today. Before she gets started, I just want to remind you that you can ask questions in the box at the right hand side of your screen and that Angela will address those questions at the end of her talk. So thank you very much for attending and welcome, Angela. Thank you, Sarah, and um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today to learn a bit about the forest fire, smoke and respiratory health in British Columbia. Um, and um, uh, from the start, I want to first acknowledge that some of the slides in today's presentation is actually adapted by, uh, uh, adapted from previous presentations from Dr. Sarah Henderson. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, as you may already know, BC is a very forested place. Um, about 70% of BC's land is actually covered by forests. And this pie chart, uh, the color choice of this pie chart actually says a lot of what I want to say, which is they are also flammable. Um, BC has been a fire prone area uh, historically but uh, climate change is one of the major contributors to the, some of the very intense uh, forest, forest fire seasons uh, in recent years. In the past 50 years, BC's annual mean temperature has increased by 1.5 degree, and this trend is estimated to um, continue into the future. And um, the changing climate brings us um, much warmer winters. And um, because of that, more bugs now can survive this not that harsh winter. And this is one of the major reasons for the outbreak of pine, uh, of mountain pine beetles since 2003 in the province. In this map, you can see um, the gray areas indicate that uh, in this area, almost all of the pine trees were killed by um, mountain pine beetles. And you can imagine how much of that wood you can find in this area. And um, that wood equals to very ample fields to burn. And um, in addition to the hot summers, all it needs is just a sparkle. Um, it can be a lightning or it can be just an it can be a cigarette butt that's not um, distinguished. Um, so um, this figure shows us the annual area burned in BC. And you can see since the outbreak started in 2003, we've seen a few very intense uh, forest fire seasons in the past 10 years. And this figure uh, does not include uh, 2014, which actually had the most area burned in, uh, actually the third most air annual area burned in the history of BC. This year, it seems that we have a pretty early start of forest fire season. And the Little Bobtail Lake fire near Prince George um, has already burned uh, almost 25,000 hectares of forest. And um, as all we all know, fire is a direct threat to our life and properties if it's close to our communities but it's actually the smoke emitted from these fires that can impact a much, much larger population. Um, this smoke can travel a long way um, and degrade the air quality 
both near the fire and also very, very far away from the fires. Um, forest fire smoke is a very complex mixture of different gases and um, particles, but the particulate matter, especially fine particulate matter, PM2.5, is the most studied um, pollutants in um, this mixture. Um, that's because, first of all, uh, it is the most elevated pollutants during uh, smoke events, and uh, the the elevation is consistent both near and far from the fire. And um, it is uh, one of the regularly measured pollutants uh, by our government. And also it has been widely studied and it has been associated with a wide range of different health effects. Um, this figure of the gray bars shows the daily average provincial wide uh, mean PM uh, 2.5 concentrations for the last um, 10 years. And uh, the black dots indicate the days with extreme fire activities across the province. Um, as you can see, most of the time, the average PM 2.5 concentrations in the province is around 5 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, and most of, the, uh, most of the high values are actually, uh, actually occurred during smoky days. Um, so forest fire smoke is a major contributor to the extreme PM exposures we, we've seen in this province. And this is just the province-wide uh, average. So if we are looking at the concentrations in uh, monitoring stations that's close to the fire, we can actually see uh, concentrations up to over 200 micrograms per cubic meter, which is really, really high compared to the background, um, background concentrations in our province. Um, and we're interested in the health impacts from forest fire smoke exposure. Um, so first of all, we need to know how much we are exposed to um, this um, pollutants. And there are several options to um, measure the population exposure. Um, the most widely used option is the air quality monitors they can have a very high time resolution um, measurements um, and they are they are pretty they are most of most of the time they are pretty robust and um, and they have been used widely in both public health surveillance as well as uh, epidemiology studies um, bc has over 50 monitors that have hourly measurements of PM2.5, and it's actually not bad. It's a, actually a quite dense network in North America, but still, um, you can imagine 50 monitors cannot cover everywhere in BC. So we have a large population that does not have um, monitors close by, and um, and also, most of these monitors are designed to measure urban pollutants, uh, urban air, air pollution, as well as industry, uh, industry emissions. So they're usually not a good representative of the rural area that's actually most impacted by forest fire smoke. And um, benefiting from the uh, advancing technology. Nowadays, we can use satellite imaging to um, uh, detect and measure the particle concentrations in the atmosphere. It has, uh, it can have a very large coverage, but uh, the limitation is that it can only, we can only have a bird's eye view, which means we don't know whether the smoke or the particles are actually on the ground level 
that we are actually exposed to. So it can be very up in the atmosphere that's um, not really re relevant to public health. So at the BC CDC, we develop a um, smoke exposure model, an empirical model to in integrate the, these two um, sources, of, sources of data. So we develop a st statistical model to estimate uh, ground level PM 2.5 from uh, using satellite data, monitoring data coupled with some meteorology data. Um, to estimate PM 2.5 for all populated areas in the uh, in BC, and also we have tools to actually forecast smoke ahead of time, and this can be very beneficial for um, public health intervention because we can plan our action ahead of time, and. Um, these systems usually provide res spatially resolved and time temporally resolved service PM predictions, um, and it can also cover a very large area. Um, right now, we have two um, systems. One is the Blue Sky Smoke Forecasting System, as well as uh, the Firework developed by Environment Canada. And these systems use information about the current fire activities as well as uh, the weather conditions to make predictions of these um, smoke dispersion. Um, so with all these tools that, uh, that we can use to evaluate our exposure, now we can um, move ahead to look at health impacts. Um, I guess many of you are familiar with this pyramid of um, health impacts. As uh, many other air pollutants, um, forest fire smoke can also have uh, health impacts from the as mild as uh, subclinical symptoms like itchy eyes or itchy throat, uh, very uh, to very up to the very severe uh, outcomes like mortality. And the proportion of the population affected by such um, health effects will decrease as the as the severity of that effect increase. In other words, um, more severe outcomes, fewer people are affected. And um, Next, I will introduce uh, some of the epidemiology studies done in British Columbia in the order from mild to severe um, outcomes. Um, first of all, um, the Elliot and colleagues at the BCCDC conducted this um, study on the relationship between subutamol sulfate dispensations and um, the exposure to PM 2.5 during forest fire seasons. Um, subutamol sulfate is a commonly used uh, medication for relieving uh, symptoms in people with asthma and COPD. And um, in this study, they found that uh, for every 10 micrograms per cubic meter increase in PM 2.5 during forest fire um, seasons and in fire impacted areas, um, there, there was 5% increase in the daily counts of subutamol dispensations. And in this figure for um, the uh, caribou chicotin local health area, we can see very clearly the relationship between the spike of PM 2.5 and the spike of the, um, of the subutamol dispensations. And this local health area is actually the one that was, small, uh, was most impacted by the massive fires in 2010. <clears throat> And then we can move a little bit up to the uh, of the py pyramid to um, look at physician visits. Um, during the 
forest fires in Kelowna in 2003, Hendersons and colleagues uh, found that um, there was a 6% increase in asthma physician uh, asthma specific physician visits and 2% increase in all respiratory physician visits um, during the um, during the fire and um, this figure again you can see a very clear relationship between the access physician visits and the SS PM 2.5 exposure compared to the baseline um, without fires. And um, a limitation for these um, more mild health outcomes is that uh, we are not sure whether these are actually the um, because of the health responses from the population or because of people um, being getting ready and stocking up medications or visiting the physicians for just to get pre prescriptions. Um, so we also need to look at some uh, more severe um, outcomes. For example, in the very same study on the Kelowna fire, um, they also look at the hospital admissions um, during the study period pyramid and they found that uh, the hospital admissions for all respiratory causes increased by 5% for every 10 micrograms per cubic meter increase in PM 2.5. So now we want to look at the very top of the pyramid um, which is um, mortality and um, there have been a few studies looking at this re mm -hmm. relationship between mortality and uh, forest fire smoke, but the results, uh, the results were quite inconsistent. So some found significant effects, but not in the other. Um, this is actually not that surprising because for, mo um, for mortality, it's at the top of this pyramid, which means that it needs the most power to detect um, this health effect, um, which also means that we need a very large population or a very long time series to have enough data, enough power to detect any um, of the mortality effects. Um, um, in most of these pe uh, pe previous studies, they use monitoring stations. Uh, they use the data from monitoring stations as their exposure assessment tool. But uh, as I've mentioned before, um, we don't have monitors everywhere. In BC, 38% of all the deaths occurred in areas that do not have a monitor within 10 kilometers. So if we are going to do a mortality study in BC and we want to use monitoring stations, we will have to leave out a very large chunk of the population. And this will have a very big impact on the power of the study because, of course, BC is not known to have a big population. And, uh, and also, we may leave out the populations that actually have uh, which were uh, most impacted by forest fires because they are in the more rural areas of the province. Um, so the, the, our model uh, developed at the BCCDC can actually help to solve this problem because it um, produced estimates that can uh, for all populated areas in the province. So that's what we did and this is the preliminary results from our mortality study and um, we found that uh, the model estimated PM 2.5 during fire days as uh, uh, was associated with 9% increase in odds of all respiratory mortality and 8% increase in stroke-related mortality. 
And this figure shows um, what would have happened if we were using uh, the mon monitoring station. So, um, which means that we will only have 62% of the deaths uh, in the study. For all uh, cardiovascular mortality and stroke, it doesn't make a big, big difference. That's probably because more people died of uh, cardiovascular diseases and stroke uh, compared to uh, respiratory or lower respiratory tract in infections. Um, but for these two respiratory um, related deaths, um, the, the estimates using monitoring measurements were actually much lower and they are not significant uh, compared to the result that we get that can cover all deaths and using the model estimates. And that was um, a review of um, those epidemiology studies in British Columbia. Uh, and it actually covers a, a lot in that health effect pyramids. Uh, a lot of uh, different levels have been covered, but we still have a lot more to know about um, forest fire smoke exposure and its health impact. For example, um, what about the ex if we are only exposed for smoke for a few hours? Most of the previous studies used daily average exposure, um, but the same daily ex, uh, daily average exposure of 24, uh, 25 micrograms per cubic meter, as here in the figure, can actually have two very different scenarios. In the blue, blue line scenario, we have um, most hourly exposure around 25. And we also have another scenario, the red scenario, which we have lower um, exposure in most of the time, but we have a peak, a huge peak in the middle of the day. So the question is, should we worry about this peak? Um, and this will be, at, uh, this will actually be the top major topic of my PhD thesis. So I hope you stay tuned. Um, then um, now that we know there has been quite sufficient evidence on the health impacts of forest fire smoke, then what can we do to actually mitigate these impacts as public health agencies as well as susceptible individuals? Most of what I'm about to talk um, is uh, some highlights from this public health guidelines developed in at the BCCDC last year. So you can find a lot more details in this document. Before, actually long before the forest fire season starts, public health agencies should be ready with at least three things. First is a surveillance system that can monitor both the exposure and the health responses. And, all, and second is uh, a, a set of evidence-based messaging that can, you, that can be used to com communicate with the public. This um, sometimes can be challenging because the evidence for evidence-based messaging may not always be available. And thirdly, um, we should also have a very concrete action plans for different interventions. And I'll talk about this more in the following. And uh, after the massive fire seasons in 2010, regional health authorities uh, requested the BCCDC to develop a um, public health surveillance system for um, forest fire smoke. And in 2012, the BC Asthma Monitoring System, BCAM, uh, started its operation. And there has been a few different versions uh, as time goes by. 
and the current version provides a weekly report for each health uh, each health service delivery area, and in in each uh, in a report it provides two pieces of information. On the upper panel of the plot, it shows uh, uh, the surveillance on uh, health outcomes. And in this example, we have um, visit, asthma physician visits as the uh, as our measure of health response. And we also have a report that using um, subutamol sulfate dispensation as the health measure. And um, for this um, health surveillance system, it will alert when the observed counts of the health measure, for example, here is the asthma physician visits. If the observed count is, um, a, ex is exceeding the expected range of these um, counts that we uh, that we asked him, uh, that we expect from the historical trend, then uh, you you will see these like yellow or red bars that's alerting that it's abnormal. On the lower panel of the plot, we have um, the surveillance for exposure. We have four measures of PM two point five. Um, the one uh, measurements from monitoring stations, estimates from the BCCDC exposure model, and also predictions from the two for, uh, smoke forecasting system. So the basic idea for this um, whole system is that if we see a spike in, um, in the health measure and spikes in the exposure measures at the same time, we are very likely to um, see, uh, we're, we're pretty sure that we're seeing some impacts from forest fire smoke. And um, then effective communication with the public is a very a key to um, mitigate the public health Im impact. And we should have very clear advice uh, to the public on who should do what during the smoke events. Some common advice include um, something like staying indoors or uh, reducing physical activities outdoors. And uh, also activating the action plans if you have asthma or COPD. But some of the advices can be controversial. For example, um, the use of masks. Um, although a properly fitted N95 respirator can, um, can actually reduce your exposure to PM2.5, but um, it is not suitable for all the population because it will create um, it will create breathing resistance. So this can be quite dangerous for people with pre-existing respiratory or cardiovascular diseases. So if we are going to um, put out message on um, or recommendation on using mask, we should make these limitations uh, very clear to the public. And uh, on the other hand, there are a few studies um, looking at the Use, uh, looking at using hyper air filtration during smoke events. And the evidence has shown that uh, it's actually quite effective in reducing uh, indoor uh, exposure. Um, in this figure, we can see that before using hyper filter, um, the indoor concentrations and outdoor concentrations are pretty similar and they change together. Um, but after using the HEPA filter, um, there's, there was a larger difference between indoor and outdoor. And also the indoor concentration doesn't change that much um, along with the outdoor concentration. So a properly sized HEPA um, air cleaners used in a well-insulated uh, room can greatly reduce indoor PM during smoke events. Uh, 
um, there are uh, we should also have plans for other interventions um, for example counseling outdoor events providing community clean air shelters augmenting air filtration in institutions like long-term care facilities and finally evacuating and um, public health agencies should have a detailed plan um, on when to trigger these interventions and how they are going to be implemented uh, with operations from different, um, different agencies. And more information about these in interventions can be found in the guideline I just talked about. Um, but generally speaking, there has not been a whole lot of evidence on the effectiveness of these interventions. So I, I think um, this is a real knowledge gap to be filled. Um, for susceptible individuals, um, before fire season starts, they should be ready with ample rescue medication, a plan to minimize exposure, for example, to have a designated room with air filtration, and um, also emergency backup plan if one and two are not enough. And we have talked about um, the measure should be taken by susceptible population, but who is the susceptible? Um, most evidence uh, indicates that populations with pre-existing respiratory and cardio or cardiovascular diseases are the uh, are the most vulnerable. And a side note is that. Um, some of these populations may not know they have pre-existing conditions, so that can be tricky. And, um, and uh, other susceptible populations include adults over 65 years of age and children, and also unborn children, um, because there has been some new study um, that found relationship between birth outcome and um, exposure to forest fire smoke during pregnancy. Some take home messages. Um, there will be more forest fires and more smoke. And there are many tools that we can use to help evaluate and forecast the exposure to forest fire smoke and exposures can trigger pre-existing respiratory diseases. Um, a lot more knowledge of health effects and intervention effectiveness is needed for us to, um, uh, to better, better understand and also mitigate um, the impact from forest fire smoke. And also public health agencies and susceptible individuals should have a plan in response to smoke events. Thank you. Thanks very much, Angela. We're just going to look to see uh, what kind of questions the online audience had. We have a tiny little window here and they're coming in. So I think Angela will read the question aloud and give the answer to the best of her ability, and I will jump in with any further information if I think it's necessary. Um, so the first question is, the, uh, is the 8% increase in deaths attributable to PM 2.5 due to decreased survivability because of decreased air quality? Or is there a mechanism um, whereby PM 2.5 can induce strokes? Um, I have to confess that I'm not an expert on the mechanism, but I do know a little bit about um, the uh, some of the theories. Um, one theory for um, PM 2.5 induced uh, stroke is that it can it can have an impact on the already vulnerable, uh, if the person already have a cardiovascular pre-existing condition, and it can actually trigger the um, stroke attack, uh, attack itself. So I think that's the second one in this question. Um, 
Um, so the second question, will you be sending out a copy of PowerPoint post webinar? Yes, we will. Um, um, there, there was some unpublished um, figures in the presentation, so I will be sending out a reduced version of the, uh, of the slides. The third question, since air filters need to be used with windows closed, what about concern for high temperatures indoors? I think that's a very good question because forest fire smoke um, actually also uh, usually it occurs with high temperature um, conditions. So this is definitely a concern, I think. Um, so maybe other measures should be uh, considered. For example, ideally, uh, an air conditioner will be the ideal choice, um, but I know it's not um, always available for everyone, so maybe some community um, um, air, clean, a clean air shelter can, um, can, be, uh, can be implemented if, if needed. Um, the next question, not all heat per filters are created equal. Any <laughs> suggestions on what we can recommend to clients? Uh, I'm not uh, an expert on heat per filters, so I don't think I can comment <laughs> on this. Um, yeah. And then, you have um, I, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to make any recommendations whatsoever, but I'm quite sure that the studies that have demonstrated the efficacy of HEPA filters actually talk about the manufacturers and the filtration that was used in the study. So certainly going directly to the literature would provide some evidence around which filters are known to be effective because they've actually been evaluated. Um, then next question, curious if we have measured any health impacts from the chemical fire in Vancouver recently. Um, not I'm aware of yet. <clears throat> I can jump in on that too. A uh, very different kind of smoke compared with what we've been talking about today to uh, the best of our evaluation of emergency room visits and calls to various uh, health lines in the province. There were no very significant impacts of that event and, and it looks like the interventions used by uh, Vancouver Coastal Health were quite effective in protecting the public. Um, and then next question, why is it more done about wood burners in crowded places that have access to gas, yet burn away and can make more smoke than the 2010 season for people right next door? It is too easy to say that it is up to the municipal bylaws and higher levels of government should be making stricter laws about wood burners in crowded places. In my brain short, even health officials sometimes promote wood burning as uh, so clean, green, cheap, and even good exercise. Um, I think we've, I think we've also done some studies on um, on uh, wood uh, smoke and uh, in especially in uh, the upper. Uh, the more northern area, and we are also trying to monitor the the exposure and uh, the emissions and the exposure from this uh, wood burning um, area. And um, um, and um, there are some. I, I think there are some hot, uh, hot spots, like some uh, pollution hot spots due to wood burning. And um, there are a few programs uh, that I think are trying to um, change um, the type of wood uh, burning facilities so that we can have more um, cleaner um, stoves. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Fair. 
And then next one, very interested in the effect of short-term PM 2.5 peaks early on health. Yay! Can you give us a sneak preview of some of your thesis work and if short-term PM 2.5 spikes are as important as long-term exposures from a public health perspective. So um, I'm actually at um, just finished my first year of my PhD. So um, the, the I'm still at the stage of writing the proposal, so I cannot talk a li uh, too much about the results. But from the literature that I have read about short-term peaks in PM 2.5, um, there is evidence on um, that um, some uh, health outcomes, especially uh, cardiovascular health outcomes, can actually be triggered by just a few hours of exposure. So I. Uh, I feel that it's um, it's an important question to uh, be addressed. And uh, currently, there is only one. Uh, there is one study in Australia that looks at um, um, a short-term exposure to um, forest fire smoke and uh, oh, not not forest fire smoke, but uh, PM forest fire. Smoke. Forest fire. Smoke. Yeah, forest fire smoke, and if actually found a significant increase in um, ambulance out of hospital cardiac out, arrest yes so cardio um, um, the uh, cardiac uh, cardiac arrest so um, I think my thesis is going to <laughs> add a bit more to this literature um, then forest fires are random events beyond our control Forest company slash burning in the BC interior is planned and approved by the provincial government. It seems to me that slash burning needs to be eliminated to reduce respiratory effects that are at least as damaging as those from forest fires. Are you aware of any health studies involving slash burning? Um, not, I, I'm not aware of um, any studies on um, slash burning, um, but I my feeling is that um, they are usually done. They should be done, um, accounting for the meteorology conditions. So um, that may and the scale of slash burning. Sometimes, um, most of the time, it's not as large as forest fires. So, um, yeah, it will be interesting to see. I'll just add to that that in in the model that we run at the VCCDC for exposures, we do see slash burning come up in the remote sensing imagery, and it is included in our model. So some of the some of the results that Angel's presented here may have a little bit of influence from from slash burning in them, uh, but slash burning certainly is a huge source of exposure uh, in, in nearby areas. Um, I am very interested in your peak level studies since I developed lymphoma six months after the forest fire smoke of 2010 and was told that lymph nodes collect and have trouble with some of the 2.5 particulate, possibly leading to cancer. Thanks for your work and interest in this. Thank you. Um, and then we have another question. Is there any synergistic effects with PM 2.5 during hot days when ozone concentration is expected to rise? Um, I uh, I think there has been a study that indicated that um, during forest fire smoke events, PM both PM two point five and ozone actually uh, increase during the events. So it, it is possible to, uh, that they will have um, synergistic effects. But um, I think the um, a point is that uh, PM two point five can um, travel a longer way than ozone, uh, generally speaking. So PM 2.5 emitted from the forest fires, they can travel to very far away, but ozone is usually 
a bit more local? <clears throat> it, it's a complex question. So ozone gets generated locally through photochemical reactions, basically. And we certainly do see increases in ozone when there's forest fire smoke around. I think the more important part of this question is really that synergistic effect between forest fire smoke and extreme heat. Often the time, the conditions under which we're going to have extreme smoky weather is also the conditions under which we're going to have extremely hot weather. And this is certainly something that was best evidenced from Russia during the 2010 forest fire season, where they had an extreme heat wave and an incredible amount of smoke. And recent analyses from that, from that episode definitely showed that there was synergy between those two different exposures that contributed to a much higher mortality rate than either exposure alone would have produced. So it's definitely a concern and it's definitely a growing concern in the context of climate change where we expect both of these types of things to happen more frequently and more severely. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any further questions, so we will uh, sign off and say thank you very much to Angela for a carefully prepared presentation. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact Angela or myself at the VCCDC and uh, keep healthy out there during the forest fire season, everybody.